Hello Hi. everybody, welcome back to our Thursday Live. Uh, today we're going to have some exciting things for you. Um, we're going to show you our method of uh, mounting a deer head and we're going to take it all the way through, not just today, in the next several weeks. I'm here with Amber Ingalls, uh, Brett Wingfield, our substitute camera lady, Mandy Swart, Hello. Uh, because of a last minute emergency. And um, we're gonna cover a lot of things today. I think we're gonna show them um, how to measure for an accurate fit, yep. um, maybe cutting antlers, ordering forms, um, measuring your hides to make sure they're gonna fit the forms. Uh, Amber's gonna show you fleshing. Um, Brett's gonna put some antlers on, rough up a form, and we're gonna take this as far as we can each week uh, until the deer heads mounted. And this applies not only to whitetail, although we're working on a whitetail, it also applies to uh, uh, mule deer, caribou, elk. It's all basically a very similar similar uh, technique that we use on everything. Um, with that, I guess maybe we'll get started and uh, I can draw on the board a little bit. And if you have any questions, make sure that you, uh, you know, text them Comment. in to Mandy. Yeah. Comment, in, right? Comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know your questions. We'll answer as we go. And if we don't get to them, we will definitely get back to you after the live is over. And you can always go to our Facebook page and watch all of our last live videos and stay up to date on everything. And we and have a lot, of, a lot of announcements. We have winner's announcements. We have show announcements. We have new product announcements. We got a whole lot of things. Giveaways at the end. Make sure you stay tuned for giveaways at the end. Okay, with that we'll get started. Yeah, we're gonna go from station to station to station, and and uh, we'll go to one person, and when when you kind of got that technique down, we'll go to the next uh, procedure and the next procedure until you're kind of getting the idea of what we do here. Okay, uh, measurements are very very important. Um, you can't. We don't do anything here without without accurate measurements. And it all starts with um, when the deer comes in. The customer brings a, a deer cape in, and I would say 90% of ours, we get the head and the antlers and the remaining skin attached. Um, you, a lot of times there's enough of a neck that you can get the measurement off of there. But the one measurement that is, is really important to me is if you look in the catalogs, um, it's this nose to the front corner of the eye. The front corner of the eye will have a little peak, kind of a little point, and usually most of the catalogs call that A. And to us in the Midwest, I mean around Iowa here, um, I always say that um, somebody told me one time, like with people, um, the only thing that never stops growing are your noses and your ears. That's why you see these uh, old guys that have great big ears, you know, down to their shoulders and they have uh, um, you know, a great big hook nose. Uh, I think it's a little bit similar with deer. The older the deer we get, it seems like the, the longer the nose to eye measurement is. If we get a, a great big, you know, big heavy 160 to plus deer antlers, I would bet that around our area here, I'm looking at a seven and three quarters. Um, if we get something like a little bitty tiny basket rack, seven and a quarter. Most of the deer we mount, I bet if I had to take 80% of them, I'm gonna say seven and a half. But anyway, usually that, uh, all, your, all your catalogs will show you where to measure for an accurate form selection. Most of them, I think all of them that I know of, A is to the tip of the nose, front corner of the eye. And make sure when you measure that tip of the nose, don't wrap your tape around the front of the nose. Do it as if that nose is touching a wall and measure right to the front corner of the eye. You're gonna fall in the um, bracket of seven, seven and a quarter, seven and a half, seven, three quarters, big monster, maybe eight, maybe possibly bigger. Um, that's gonna be the A measurement. That you can almost always get off of any of the um, deer that come in because customers typically don't, don't uh, cape them out. Um, when we cape the deer, some of you are used to making long cuts all the way down the back. That's fine. Some people don't mind sewing, some people do. A lot of people make a little wide cut or a little short cut where they go from antler to antler and stop right behind the ears. Um, whichever cut you make, um, if you have any of the neck left in, 
you can do a circumference around that neck according to the legend that's in your catalogs. And if you look in any of the catalogs, this is a Matuska catalog, but um, you're gonna have something that looks like this. It's got A. You have a more detailed one on it. And a B page. and a C. And I think the detailed one is on the semi-sneak page, and that will show you how to measure a cape too. Now don't be confused because I think McKinsey's go A, C, B. I think Ohio does it the same way as we do, and I think we do it A, B, and C, we go in order. The B measurement is the circumference in the valley right behind the ears. The C measurement is over the atlas. Here's the valley right behind the ears where his neck basically joins his head. Um, he has an atlas vertebrae. It's his very first vertebrae right here. And that's gonna be over the atlas where his swell begins. And that's gonna be the C measurement. Not to confuse you, but if you look in McKinsey, follow the diagram, you know, rather than what I'm telling you. Um, they will be A, C, B, we are A, B, C, we're going over. <clears throat> Once you, once you skin this deer out, this is going to be very accurate because the deer just came in. Um, once you skin this out, you can take a carcass measurement for these. If there's not enough neck in there, you can measure the skin. And to measure the skin, you're going to see where the ears are. If you open it all the way up like this, you can measure your B like so. Go about three inches back for your C measurement, and that should put you pretty close to over the atlas. This is your important measurement. Over the atlas is your important measurement. That's the one that's gonna determine his swell. A lot of times you're gonna see about a two inch difference between the B and the C. I like to take measurements when I cape the deer, and I like to compare them to the deer that comes back from the tannery. So if I, this deer that, um, we have is like seven and three quarters, must be about um, 20, 20 by 22. So that's how I would measure them for, for a fit. But I always take measurements when I cape the deer out and then I compare them to the tan measurements. If I get a, this cape back from the tannery and I'm only getting 18 by 20, the first thing I'm gonna do is start looking for punch codes to make sure I have the right Cape, so we don't. Do you want to show them on a cape? Do you have a cape? I have a cape here. Okay, now for me to measure with either a tape or a ruler, it does it does little good for me to measure this because this leather stretches like crazy. You can compress it to whatever you want. You can stretch it to ever, whatever you want. <clears throat> Measuring a tan cape for the nose to eye doesn't do a whole lot of good. Um, it does help if you have a form in the shop that is a seven and a half, seven and three quarters, whatever. Slide this on and see how it fits. See how your lips line up, see how your eye lines up. Um, the most accurate measurement you can get nose to eye is when it's before you skin it. So we always write that down in our code book with our punches. Now this is a shortcut deer. Um, when you measure for a form and it comes back from the tannery, we do a lot of wet tans. If you get a dry tan, you're gonna to to soak it up, get the leather nice and soft, let it sweat for a while so it's thir thoroughly permeated with moisture. Then stretch this hide. Don't, don't go crazy, don't tear holes in him. Um, that leather is nice and strong and stretch it out because the tanning process dramatically shrinks up leather. So don't be afraid to really put some pressure on it. If it's an opened up cape, I kind of watch the brisket and I stretch him sideways and just make sure that the brisket doesn't start so you don't get a short little deer like this. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna lay him out here. Okay, you have your Hides back from the tannery. You determine whose is whose. You already should know what kind of a measurement you're looking for. 
Now I'm going to take on this one, I'm just going to take a steel yard stick, my A, my B measurement right behind the ears is already comfortably without stretching a 22. That's 11, so I double it. 11 and 11, 22. I'm going to go down here a little bit. And I, without, you don't want to bulge that yardstick out too far. I can get a comfortable 12 inches here. So we're looking at about a 24. 22 by 24. Seven and three quarters, 22 by 24. That's a pretty, pretty decent sized deer. <clears throat> I will go to the catalog. Um, this happens to be a um, semi upright, I think. And we use a lot of competitors' choices. We like them. Um, a seven and three quarters by a, um, here's a 21 by 23. I can go a 21 by 24 or 21 by 23. Um, CC 173 is a seven and three quarters, 21 by 23. And I think that should work pretty good for this deer. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? I don't like running the camera. <laughs> You're too close to it. Okay. Do you want to test fit that and see if it fits? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> we want to, um, we can test fit. Do we want to run over and look at some of the options? Oh, gosh, do that. Um, we've chosen a 173, which is a semi upright form. Um, now, I went down just a little bit, and you have the choice to go up or go down. Don't struggle to mount deer. I mean, that's a nice large deer, so don't be afraid to go down a small amount, but not a lot. And we'll show you when we test fit, too, um, what we're looking for. Um, the 173 is a semi-upright. That's this form here. We're just looking off of our customer ticket. But we've got several different options. Most of the companies out there do. Um, and we've got them up here from all the way from a extremely upright. This is our upright offset um, to our semi-upright. We'll go over here to a semi-sneak, all the way down to a full sneak. So Kirsten, if you can come from this side of me and look at these forms, our semi-upright, if you look at the bottom jaw, is about even with the top of the back or slightly above. The upright offset, the jawline will be above the top of the back. Moving across our semi-sneak, typically the jawline will be slightly below the top of the back. And when you come to a full sneak, the jawline will be significantly under and often the eye will be below the top of the back. So you have, a, you have a lot of options when it comes to whitetail deer, probably the same in the mule deer lines, um, but we've got them all the way through these standard forms, even into some of our specialties like the wall pedestal. Um, wall pedestals are something we do more and more of. You saw a really cool elk that we did not too very long ago that was here, um, and that's another option that you can offer to your customers. You've got, a, you've got the choice of poses and turns, left and right, um, so lots of choices out there. What do we carry? 120-ish, maybe from a past video. I think we've got about that many whitetail, maybe even more. Yeah, a couple um, years more. Yep. So lots of stuff out there. Really good forms. Make sure you're getting a great fit and a great pose. Um, and once you've selected your deer, um, this is the form that we've selected. We need to test fit it. So we're going to take this tape. And we're going to put it on. It's, it's nicest if you'll do a quick test fit um, before you get too far into your project, before you set antlers and cut tear ducts and lip slots um, and start doing any damage to the form. If you'll do a quick test fit, um, you'll know kind of what, you're, what you have out there to expect. I'm going to stretch it one more time. I think this is probably the most important part of getting a good fit is getting a good accurate stretch out of your skin. And makes sewing a lot easier. Yeah. And then we can just, we're gonna drape it over. This one being a tube cut is gonna be 
a little bit of a challenge, but should slide over good. Um, bring this up over the face, untuck the nostrils. Now we're just going to work that skin down. We don't want that. We don't want to have to fight too hard to get it into place, but we want to make sure that we've got all of the deer that the customer brought us. One of the worst things we can do is give him something less than what he brought in. He short, or she. Short fish or little deer. <laughs> you won't be in business be, long. We'll be in trouble. Um, it's nice to have some of the upholstery pins or T-pins just to help hold your hide in place. At the time, we're going to pin some of the gnomes, things that we know go um, where they are, we've got the brisket down here on the bottom. That's in, on center, so we'll put a pin there to hold us. We've got the front of the leg and armpit. We'll put a couple of pins there. And what you'll find is if you, if you pull this hide off too far, you'll start to compress. He'll get too far down over the swell and you won't get a good fit. Um, sometimes if you're struggling with your fit, you may have to move your skin up, um, further up the neckline. Okay, so we've got all of those. We're also gonna look at the nose. We're a little bit dry. You can see this is a little white. It doesn't hurt to have some water on hand. Um, you can make sure your hides are good and hydrated. We like to soak ours and then spin them out in the in the washing machine just to make sure we get all the water out for later. Not your wipes. Um, if you do, make sure and rinse it out good before she gets home. Rinse cycle after you spin your capes. Um, yeah, we we're going to make sure the front corner of the eye is where it needs to be and the tear duct. That feels really good right there. Just gonna put a pin up above it. And then I'm gonna do the same on the other side. Making sure that the, we have a good fit to the face as well. That's the neck. Lip line's where the lip line needs to be. Comes down nicely. Fits over the nose. And then we're gonna come to the back, the back incision. Kirsten, you may wanna look over here. I'll break it down so the camera can see it. Now we brought up a 173 um, and we want to make sure that this fits nice, but we may be right in between forms. We might be at a form where we could choose to go up a size. I'm going to bring my incision here, making sure that my ear canal comes all the way, stays at the index point here. We're going to bring the base of the ear to the ear canal. And then I'm going to feel what the incision feels like. And actually, I, this incision is a little bit, we've got a little overlap here. I would say we could probably go up a size on this deer. Bring that together and I think everything works well. Um, so that's kind of what you're going to look for. The next thing I would do quickly as you test fit, you may want to use a little form rougher to taxi your skin a little bit, making sure that you've got everything where it needs to go. And then you can run a brush through it. And the reason we like to run a brush through the hair is to make sure that we, that our hair is going to lay nicely, that we have everything accounted for, our fit is good. And in the case of this deer, right here, you can see we've got a flaw, and this actually is a, looks like we've got a slug hole right here. Iowa, our slug season or comes in December, we, we bring in a lot of deer and this is pretty common. Um, we're gonna have a pretty significant repair here. Now, on the shoulder in this location, I think it would sew up pretty well. If that, if that hole was further up into the neck area, in order to get that repaired, we may have to remove some material, which might change your fit. So make sure that you evaluate your cape really well
before you do your test fit or during the test fitting process so that um, you know that he's still going to fit good after you do all your repairs. Um, and with that, I think we're about ready to move over to some flushing. We have Rick Dunlap from West Virginia watching, Rob from North Dakota, Jeremy Lee from Central Iowa, Mac Knudsen from Wisconsin, Kenneth Jolly from Kentucky, Great Falls, Montana, Daniel Hunter, um, Kevin and Amber from OKC, Dusty Sickle from North Dakota, Rob Pierce from Mason City, um, Richard Sarah Harney from Alaska, we have Virginia, Robbie Anderson. You guys, hello, hello, thanks for watching. We are thanks live watch. every Thursday at 4.30 Central Time. The guys are doing Bob Helm from Kansas. Why am I getting angry faces? Quinn must be watching. I hope oh, so. Oh man, Quindolin. So. Hearts only, Quinny. Um, David Prince from Alaska. We love doing this. Dennis Grundy, I just talked to Dennis from Australia. He was just warming up some coffee for the morning. Um, thanks for watching you guys. We go live every Thursday 430. If you've missed our videos, we did have a question earlier on um, paint, how to advice on recoloring antlers. Amber has her favorite tips and tricks for that. So we do these lives every Thursday 430 Central Time. If you go to our Facebook and are following us, they'll notify you when we go live, but you can watch all our previous ones. And I think we did one two months ago and it's uh, antler repairs and finishing, and she has some fantastic tips and tricks on there. If you go check that out, and she'll answer all your questions and basically tell you her favorite colors that she likes, cocoa, cocoa, cocoa brown from Life Tone, but uh, check those out, because she- Techniques too, I even saw you using her technique yeah. the other day with yep. the Q-tip. Yep. Yep. That's pretty Ooh, These are next, Amber and I are both wearing our new tank tops that are available online at Matuska Taxidermy, so go check those out if you want some. They made me take mine off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was afraid this of the This is a comments. family program. <laughs> <laughs> Save it for home. <laughs> All right, so now Amber is gonna show you something. Yeah, flushing, flushing is probably as important as any part of this deer mounting. Yeah. Well, as soon as you get done doing all of your test fitting and whatnot, we're gonna move on to fleshing, and we want to get all of our hide really nice and thin. Now, this side here, I had already kind of pre-done, so we're gonna kind of take a look at, this is what it looked like after we got it back from the tannery, before we touched it. Um, a lot of our fleshing that we do, the finished fleshing, we actually do before we tan. Um, so we, we take off a lot of the flesh prior to the tanning process. So these are probably quite a bit cleaner um, than what most people have. But we're gonna even take this and go a little bit further yet, and we're going to turn it into this. So you can see up around the eye area, kind of made a really nice big softball size up around the eye. And that way this area is really nice and thin. And thin to win is what we always tell people because the thinner it is, the less that, that leather is gonna stretch and pull and distort at when it's in the drying process. So we wanna get that nice, nice, nice and thin. In fact, the tear ducts are so thin, you can actually even see the finger through it. You can see the coloration. And same thing with the lips, we're just gonna go through and just very, 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 very thin. Again, on the nose pad, we're gonna get it so thin that you're actually gonna to start to see the dark color of that nose pad start to come through, okay? Thin to win. Thin to win. And there's lots of different tools for doing this. It just depends on what you like. Um, you're gonna to have to try and do a little bit of everything and just kind of figure out what's working. It's gonna take a lot of practice um, and you'll find something that you prefer. So you could start off just doing a regular knife. Make sure it's nice and nice and sharp and you're just gonna nice and easy. I'm holding the knife very, very flat to the hide. Um, if, you, if you start doing sharp angles, you're gonna end up cutting into it. So we're gonna hold it very flat to the hide and then just taking a nice side motion, start to thin out that hide. And Those we're just watching, taking off. You are watching probably one of the finest finished fleshers I've ever seen. <clears throat> Amber does a nice I am, job and she's very fast. I'm not gonna be very proficient with a knife because this is actually my favorite 
tool. It's the number 22 scalpel. And this is just what I've gotten used to using over the years. Um, the number 10 scalpel is exactly the same shape. It's just a little bit smaller. So this works very, very similar to the 22. It's just smaller. So I've gotten used to the 22 size and seems like it lasts a little bit longer for me. And again, we're just gonna take and very, very carefully hold it very flat to the hide. I've gotten used to doing it over my fingers. You don't have to be that brave and do that. You can um, do it over a dowel. If you'd like, um, just be careful because you can't tell when you're using other tools like this how deep you're cutting. The reason I use my fingers is because I can feel the blade going over the top of the hide and I can feel the knife and where it's where it is for thickness. So it kind of helps me gauge just how much I'm cutting. Okay. Um, some people like the number 11 scalpels. These can be handy when you're doing certain areas um, such as on the eyes. So this eye here has been split. It's been split pretty far. Like I said, we do a lot of our, a lot of the prepping before we send to the tannery. So it's gone all the way down. You can actually start to see the little tiny hair roots for the eyelashes there. And what we're gonna do is go right below those eyelashes. So right here is the dark. You can kind of see that line right here. We're gonna kind of nice and easy start to cut in a little bit further and I can feel that blade again you're not gonna you're not gonna feel the cut you're gonna see the cut so be very very careful and now start to tip your blade to the side and you can get all of those little glands that are filling up the eyelid actually scrape them all the way out so you can start to see them getting exposed now and we're just gonna come with the scalpel and just kind of nice and easy get those right off of there and what this is going to do is when we go to mount this that hide is going to be so so thin that there's not going to be a lot of movement on top of that clay when it's drying so the more the more we take off now the less we're going to have to fix when it distorts David Compton says Dremel. And the Dremel tool. Yep, the Dremel tool. There's nothing wrong with using the Dremel tool. That was actually going to be my next one. Um, that is a biggie. There's a lot of people who, who have gotten very, very good with Dremel tools. Um, the key to using a Dremel is you have to make sure that your hide is somewhat on the dry side. You can't have it, have it real moist. So I've actually got a Dremel here because I was thinking of those people. And what we have is just one of those sanding bits set up on the sanding drum. And this is a coarse bit and it'll get a little loud. But I, I like, again, you could do it on top of a dowel or you could do it on top of your finger. I like to do it on top of my finger. Um, again, it just kind of helps me gauge for depth. So. You can just kind of come in here. It does throw a little bit of little dust particles or little uh, flesh hand hide around, so it can get a little messy if you're going to do a lot of this. But it is a very, very fine way to be able to do this, especially a lot of people will turn to doing this when it comes to doing competition because it gives such a very, very, very fine um, texture. There, you won't end up with the with the gouges that sometimes happen with scalpels, and you can even get better at that. So sometimes, even after if it's a short hair deer or competition or something really, really good, you can even do all of your all of your other finish fletching and then come through and just kind of really smooth it out. There's a lot of very good taxidermists who actually prefer the Dremel. There's nothing wrong with doing it this way. 
And again, just use your finger to gauge how deep you're going. Okay. So, okay, so I just finished with the top eyelid there. I'm just gonna kind of work my way around real quick around the bottom. Have you ever had heat issues using a Dremel slipping hair? Um, I think maybe if you stay in the same area too long because, because it is spinning and it's rotating and it does create a little bit of heat. So I think if you would maybe sit on one area and grind, 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 um, then maybe it would, it would create enough heat to cause problems. I guess I myself haven't had problems with that, but I would suggest if you're going to use a Dremel, just keep it moving and don't doidle in one area. Okay, so now we're all done kind of, kind of pulling that hide away from the eyelid here. Now we can see we've got a huge apron of skin and that's what we're gonna end up tucking in between the glass eye and the clay. So we don't need that much skin so now we're gonna go ahead and cut it off. So I kinda, I can see exactly where my eyelid is. I'm just gonna come up top here and kinda nice and easy make a flat line. I try to keep this kinda pretty because if you have little pieces hanging off, it can be awkward to tuck. So how much skin are you leaving for tucking amber? This is about what I like to leave. It's maybe a quarter of an inch, three-eighths of an inch. And everybody kind of varies. I think Tom usually leaves just a little bit more than I do. Um, the some more people... Leave, the more shrink you're going to have, too, and distortion. Right. So you don't want to have a mile of hide that you're going to have to, to tuck down inside. Um, and then if you do have too much hide, you might have a hard time getting it all rolled over without it sticking up and doing funny things. And so if you don't leave an apron, there's some pretty nice, pretty good work being done, trimmed right to the lid. Right too. to the lid, yeah. It's but again, necessary. you would have to have, I would, I would think you would have to have an extremely good finished flesh job in order to get away with that, because otherwise this hide would pull away from the, that eye. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've done all of that. When it comes to getting around your tear duct, I'll just do this real quick. When it comes to doing your your tear duct or your lacrimal crease area, it's actually a little a little bubble that we tuck up inside of hide. It's, it doesn't lay flat. So if you just try to put it across and you start flushing, you're going to cut this completely off. And that's actually really important to make sure that you have. So when I go to flush it, I stick my finger up inside of it or a dowel or something to help get that shape. And now we're just gonna kinda come from the top and work our way down. Being careful of your finger. Hmm. and kind of go all the way around. There is there is a little, I don't know, what what would you call that, Tom, the tendon? That little, oh yeah, there's a little from the, tendon in there. From the, that runs from the front corner, from the carnacle area, into your lacrimal crease, and it's right runs right in there and actually we've already taken it out but you will definitely see a very visible white tendon and you want to make sure that you get and you flesh up underneath that and get that out that's really really important so as soon as you got your lips your nose again same thing with your nose just put a dowel up inside and then just kind of start working away at it you need to have her sign a little waiver before she does this cutting that you're yeah. not responsible. Remember, I will say your muscles are pretty. I like them. They look good in what? that tank top. <laughs> 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 Got some pipes. 
Amber's rocking the new Matuska Taxidermy Supply Company tank top. She's turning red too. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. I can feel it. Like you can feel get it online. Heat. So again, I only flesh up high enough to get beyond that where that gray area ends and the the bald skin on the inside of the nose. So usually it's just inside of where that gray skin ends. If I end up with a hole up in here, I'm not worried because I'm going to end up cutting all of this off right on the inside of where that hairline ends on the nose. So you just kind of want to work it up, work it up, work it up until you end up with something like this. And then you're able to just go through and cut it off where you're right inside of that inner gray nose area. And this, this area here is going to blend really nice in with epoxy and then the only other thing i would say is make sure you go around um, nobody likes sewing with pliers um, you want to make sure that all of your seams and everything are really really nice and thin as well if you have too thick of a seam then you're going to struggle with doing all of your sewing so i would say take a dremel or a knife or whatever you want to do and thin out that seam so you have nice thin hide to be able to go ahead and sew in okay. and the skype knife <laughs> This is another little tool, it's called a Skype knife. Sorry, left-handers. Yep, this is, it is a right-handed tool. And again, kind of like the Dremel, this works best if you'd use a piece of hide that's kind of dry. So if you're gonna use a Skype knife, it's best to have your hide out for a while or take a really nice towel and kind of soak up some of that moisture This tool I wouldn't do on your hand. I would wrap it around a dowel or, or a beam or something like that. So you're just gonna make sure that you have a really nice tight surface to be able to do. And then you just kind of take it at an angle and you're gonna pull down. And now you can kind of see it's starting to roll up underneath there. This takes a, a little straight razor that just fits in there so you can just change the blades when you when it gets full and my hide isn't quite dry enough to really show how good this is but this is a wonderful little tool a lot of people like it even for working with raw hides or pickled hides as well it's a really it is a good tool And what, the, what it does is it takes and it holds that blade at a constant angle. So when I'm doing my knife, I'm holding it like this. So it's holding it at a constant angle. What that Skype knife does is it holds it at a constant angle for you so you don't have to try and figure out. This is how I kind of have figured out over the years to hold it and that'll help. And then again, when you're doing finished fleshing, hold it like a pencil, and that'll help you really get control. Jeremy Lee says he loves his Skype knife and he's left-handed. He just uses it backwards so his cuts are away from oh, him sure. instead. Sure. Which what's nice about our Skype knives are they they're stainless steel. Mm-hmm. So they don't rust on you. Yep. Yep. There's a lot of people that like these very, very much. And then you last of all then you're gonna come and do your ears so this ear is already done we just went ahead and took the cartilage off we're gonna do the same thing when you have when you get back you're gonna have the cartilage on you're gonna make one cut through just be careful so you're not cutting the skin underneath so take it bend it over cut very carefully and then you can start to peel your cartilage off and I believe that Brett and Tom kind of already had covered this in one of their earlier videos so that's like kind of why December. we mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's why I kind of already had this done a little bit so then you're just gonna work that cartilage off and come around the edges and 
when it comes to repairs. Um, are we gonna you bad, keep going. Do it good. go over repairs? You got over 200 people watching you right now. Mm -hmm. no, no pressure. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it comes to repairs, um, we like to use Fireline. And you can do it a couple different ways. You can use a single thread or a double thread. Um, there's good applique. Oh, don't fall off of there. Good application for both. So if you're into really short haired areas, I would definitely use just a single thread. This I have it looped through, but I have the tail end kind of hanging out. So I would go ahead and start by bringing it on here and just tying it on. You could do this or there's another little fancy way that you can make a knot and go through. I'm gonna try and kind of do this quickly so we can kind of cover this quick. And then this is just a plain, simple baseball stitch. I'm making sure to keep my stitches kind of close to the sides. If you have really, really thin hide, it might try to you go this way. tear. Well, <laughs> no, I know, but just slow motion. Slow motion. Slow motion for me. Slow motion. Now to end, I'm, I'm already at the, the end of my stitch, so I'm just gonna come through that last stitch. And I'm gonna pull it through this loop. So it makes a knot up around. And then I'm just gonna tie it off. Um, Jeremy just Lee wants to know through. what's the best way to get the cartilage off the ear base to keep the original inner ear detail. Okay, so to do that, it's actually kind of good. To get it off the ear, to get it off of the bottom instead of taking to it. To get the cartilage off the ear base. So you're, he's talking not to stop here, but to get it all the way off. Uh, that's yeah we usually leave it on um, it takes I mean you can work it you can you can get around those edges the problem is that when you get down into that inner ear it really grabs around those bumps and right now with the cartilage on there it's kind of holding the shape of that inner ear so as soon as you get rid of that cartilage now you just got a lot of loose flappy skin that you can't there's no structure to it so we do leave it on and actually when it gets down to the ridges we remove the cartilage down to here where about where those ridges will start and then just cut along that cartilage and then this whole thing gets pushed right down into your ear liner the amount of shrink that you encounter can't be a uh, customer will never see it and it looks pretty detailed down inside if you uh, leave the cartilage on yep the only thing I would definitely say is just make sure that you work that cartilage down all the way to where the ridges begin. I see a lot of people that stop um, way up here and that I would push, just get your thumb down in there and push it until you can get down to all the way down to that ridge down there. And you're using a baseball stitch for your repairs, is that right? I usually do. Um, Brett, do you use your, your uh, a baseball or, a whip, or a whip stitch? Yep. yep. And if you're having trouble nice. with getting cartilage off the ears, it's just practice, practice, practice. Um, make sure your ear skin is wet. It helps to keep it wet all the time. And it helps to have, I'm sorry guys, but it does help to have a little bit of fingernails. Stop chewing your fingernails. You chew your fingernails, <laughs> use Bondo ears. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, it's very difficult to get a, a hold of that cartilage when you chew your fingernails, so they don't have to be girly nails but it does help to have just a little bit of fingernail to be able to get a hold of that cartilage. Um, is that about it? Do you want me to? I think they were good there. I think that's about it. Time to do some antlers. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah, all yeah. right. 15 minutes. Good job, Amber, thanks. That was really good. Jeez, I'm marked. Um, okay, depends on what you are left with. Um, some people might have the whole top of the skull left. This is an artificial skull that's, that's going to be a, 
uh, European mount eventually, but I can use it to demonstrate on it. Put a little tape on here so I don't mark it up. A lot of times you'll have, you know, something like this that you store your antlers. Some people cook their antlers. You can cook your antlers. I've seen people bug beetle clean them, things like that. Um, you need to cut this off so that it's going to index onto your form. In order to do that, what I like to do to determine how far to cut it off is if I were to leave all this bone on here and just lower it down, I've got four inches between my um, antler burr and my eye. If you'll look at the real deer, a similar deer, this deer is probably under two inches between the back rim of the eye and the pedicle. So I'll determine what form I have. I'll put it on a mounting stand and I like to measure the eye rim to where the styrofoam quits on the mannequin. And this is gonna vary from form to form. Every manufacturer, this may be a little different. It might be a little bigger in one company. It might be a little narrower in another company. If this is the form you're using, measure from the back rim of the eye to where the styrofoam stops. Take your antlers, if it were on this one, um, I'm gonna go from the back corner of the eye I have to get rid of, let me draw a little line here, I have to get rid of bone all the way up to here. So I'm going to have to cut this all the way across like so. So once again, just to refresh, you're going to take off all the bone, because styrofoam replaces it, from the back corner of the eye to where the foam quits. From the back corner of the eye, this is where the foam quits on your mannequin. So I have to take off that much. Now this is the antlers that we're using. So if I, I don't have a back corner of the eye, I do have a little bit. I've got to take, I got to take it off all the way up to the burr. That's going to be my first cut. If you have a bandsaw, um, that works the best to cut it off with a bandsaw. You can use a sawzall or a hacksaw like this. Um, a bandsaw is much easier and a little bit cleaner, so I will cut this off. While well, he's doing that, show you guys real quick on our website, if you go to Matuska Tax and Resupply Company, this tab up here shows you what sale is going on or what's happening that day or that week. Sounds terrible. Um, another thing is a quick order. We have this quick order tab right here. and. You can basically type in anything you want. It'll pull up rocks or the thing. You just show options, add to cart. You know basically what you want. If you're a returning customer, you have everything. You know what you're getting from us. Makes it a little easier than having to go through the search bar and find everything. It smells yummy too. Um, catch us live every Thursday, 4.30 Central Time. We are still have a giveaway at the end of the show. And we'll be announcing next week's giveaway too. Now, this is a little easier for us than um, some of you people that use a lot of different forms because we're a little partial to competitor's choice and it's kind of easy. We have a system to cut these off. Um, with our competitor's choice forms, you can usually, on the front, cut this little wing off on the band. So now I, I can see how far I cut it down. I'm gonna cut this little wing off and I wanna leave maybe about a quarter of an inch in the back. So my cut is going to go from here about like so. That's going to be my next cut on the bandsaw. Was it hard talking over my saw? Good luck. <laughs> Close. Um, 
Okay, come over here from the side, Kirsten. Some people will um, go to the extent to get their an antlers set at the right angle. Some people will measure from the tip of the left main beam to the center of the nose, tip of the right main beam to the center of the nose. That works great. If you use a quarter inch bigger nose or shorter nose, it's gonna vary that and you're gonna get them tipped up or down. Um, we kind of look at these deer when they come in and we'll know if one's abnormally tipped forward or abnormally tipped back. When my first year of taxidermy, when I started mounting deer, I was a professional. I'd gone to taxidermy school. Um, I had shot two does and an entire year of deer, I mounted them because I knew those main beams paralleled the snout and I would end up with this big old bone back here and I would think, oh my gosh, it's a tumor. So I would cut it off and all of my deer for the first year in business were like this. It's amazing I'm still here, huh? <laughs> um, so I would mount my second deer and I got this big bone up here thinking, what the heck, they must be related and I'd cut that one off too. And all my deer were like that. That's not how deer antlers typically lay. They typically lay almost in a plane with the face. You sure they didn't just evolve? <laughs> they might have evolved. Um, anyway, so this is set pretty darn close and another rule of thumb for us is a couple fingers. If we got a couple fingers between that burr and here, um, that's a kind of a rule of thumb around here, you know, if we know we're getting them sit, set at a decent, decent uh, angle and distance. Um, a lot of times we do animals like uh, caribou and elk and like the stag and we don't know because we don't do them enough, we don't exactly know and we don't have the skull to go by this distance. Sometimes we'll measure it on the skin to make sure we have the right amount of distance this way. Logan wants to know if you ever cut the foam closer to the eye instead of the skull cap. We've done that, yes we have. As a matter of fact, would we just do it on the um, Cape Buffalo for sure, that Cape Buffalo, um, we did that. Caribou. Okay. Somebody want to do a hole in that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. We're going to attempt to show you in seven minutes how we set these antlers. Okay. So we usually do three holes. And this drill bit here I just picked because it's a little bit bigger than the screws that we're going to be using. That way we can slide the screws in and out of the holes without the threads catching on the bone. You don't want the threads hitting the bone when you're doing this. So I'm just going to kind of come through. We already have our third hold. I'm holding it off. So we already have our third hole back there, so now we got it like that. Um, some people like to make sure they can countersink the tops of their screw heads instead of having them sink up. It doesn't really matter. We typically don't, but you could take a little bit of a bigger hole and take it down. It's not going to hurt anything if you do. Just don't go down too far because otherwise, obviously, your screw's not going to catch anything. So... We got that. I'm going to change this out. We're going to set these with mache. So when we mix up our mache, we're going to mix it real, real, real thick. That way this is going to work as a patty. And it's... This is the premium mache. Premium. Premium mache. Yep, and again, kind of like with the rocks, I want to kind of kick this into gear and get this to set. So I added a little bit of salt, mix it up. The water is a little bit on the cool side. Um, because I like these to set a little bit faster, I do typically use hot water. Whoops. But that's okay. <laughs> We're not moving on right today, so that's okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and start mixing in that water. And we're going to want this to be a really, really, really thick. I had way too much water. We're going to want this to be really, really, really thick. Mache is cheap. Yep. So we're just going to add a little bit more mache. Now, if you had just rock mache on hand, could you use just your rock mache to do this? Sure. Yeah. I would see, yeah. I would, don't see any reason why not. And this is what you, 
A lot of people will shim their antlers up, they'll put them on, and if they're a little low on one side or high on the other, they'll pick a popsicle stick or a little chunk of wood. Um, this method we've done, and it works really good with any white-tailed deer, I think. It doesn't work with an elk or a caribou where the antlers hang off the back a little bit, but this machine that she's using is actually gonna, gonna harden and be her shim. Right, that's why we're mixing it so thick because if you mix it too thin, it's just gonna ooze out when you set the antlers on. The weight of the antlers will actually push it out. But this, it's so thick and dense that it's actually going to hold our antlers up and be the shim for this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take some and we're just gonna kind of fill that brain cavity in your skull cape. Okay. And then sometimes for good measure, I'll also take just a little bit extra because it's okay if it pushes out, just in case we need a little bit of extra height. And I'll put a little bit more just up on top. This is gonna kind of work as our... our and you're shim. using your flexible bowl there that you like so I much? I am, I am. And the little spatula sets that we've got, they work really, really, really nice for smoothing out that mache and getting a nice smooth finish once we get all done. Now we're moving kind of fast here because we're closing in on the end, but make sure that your mannequin is very level and like it's gonna hang on the wall. That is antlers the perfect. really, really nice thing about mm. those Bob Fothery mounting stands is when, like just like Tom got done saying, you wanna make sure everything is really, really level. Well, if you come around back here, you can see that there's this bolt right here and that when the mounting stand is put all the way up against it this will always be completely straight so you won't have to sit there and guess in fact I'll show you right now put a level to it and well that side isn't it's really funny I just did this earlier just to make sure and it's completely level so I don't have to worry as much about making sure why don't you use bondo uh, we can use Bondo. We can use something. Bondo. Yep. In fact, I think there's another deer that right over there that was done with Bondo. Um, some of the bigger animals that we do, we do do with Bondo because it gives a little bit more strength than what Mache does. And so then just those yeah. skull plates are cut thin. It's yeah. nice to use Bondo. Right. Right. There's nothing wrong with using Bondo. This is just a different method, a little bit cheaper. method and there's it works just fine and there's nothing yeah nothing wrong with doing this okay so I kind of smooth it up now I'm just gonna kind of take a look at it before before I get too wild and crazy now, how much and this yeah you got about 10 mm, minutes maybe 10 minutes warm yep. water and salt sets it up faster yep so now we can kind of take a look it's good and connected that's kind of why I put the patty up over the top to kind of help hold and make sure but now we can kind of take a look at it and say, hmm, you know, is it straight? Because now it's up to us to make sure we get everything back to where it's nice and level. If you took measurements, now's the time to check them. Mm -hmm. And what he's talking about measurements are like from here to mm -hmm. here, as far as tip and tilt and different things like that. And you can just kind of take each side and push it up or down, make sure that your burrs are centered so that the center of your skull plate right here is coming down the center of your mannequin. Make sure that your burrs aren't kicked way off to one side, which means you got the whole thing slid to one side of the mannequin or the other. Another part to look at is the, the back, come from the back, and you can see the center on your skull plate. You can see the center here. So make sure that you don't have it turned, something like that. And when you cape a deer, pay attention to where you took the meat off of the skull plate because some people will overbuild those areas. Right, right. And then when you're also, when you're doing bondo or mache, whatever you're doing, make sure that you're not overbuilding right underneath this burr here. If you put in too much material right here, then you're not gonna be able to get your skin back in there. So make sure that you have a nice space here to be able to put your hide back into.
Now, if we bondoed, we would do shims. We better wrap it up because yep. we're running out of time. Last week's giveaway, we were giving away these Wesnip scissors, which are like a shop favorite. And the winner is Don Staglin. So no. No way to go, What? Don. Joe, Martin, I am so sorry. Don won last week. <laughs> last week. Joe Martin won these ones. So we'll send these out to you, Joe. Sorry, Don. Well, he won last week. He won the water. I tried for you. <laughs> but, um, okay. This week's giveaway, so if you're watching late or you're not able to watch live, don't worry. You can still like and share. Make sure you like and share the video. Give us some thumbs up and hearts. Let us know. You can go review our um, Facebook page. But we're going to be giving away one of these, which is a form wrapper. This is the new style that has sides so it won't fall off. They don't even know what it's for yet. We didn't get the I know. Oh, so well, we'll I used it for a minute. Just and then this it. is the normal one, the regular. But we'll be giving your choice away next week. So make sure if you're watching it later on this week through next Thursday, you can still like and share it, and you'll be in chance to win it. Um, we are Matuska Taxidermy Supply Company, located northwest Iowa, Okaboji, by Okaboji area, if you've ever heard of that. Not Okeechobee. Okeechobee, nope. <laughs> um, we also have a school, Northwest Iowa School of Taxidermy. Give us a call if you want to do some classes. We offer a nine-week residential course. We also have a couple two-week courses we're doing in advance. So even if you've gone to school somewhere besides here, you can still come. We're VA approved. Is your fish class full yet? We have a specialty Not fish yet. class by this guy, world champion, Brett Wingfield. I think we've been finalized the 2019 calendar. There's some fun stuff yep. coming up in the spring. Make sure you like and follow us on Facebook because we do all sorts of fun stuff if I can keep him doing it all the time. Um, Brett is going to the Missouri show, which is in like, like the, Ozarks. the Ozarks, which would be a fun one. Weekend so vacation. that's, he's leaving Thursday and he's also judging fish yeah. and he's doing a seminar, which we're kind of excited about this, but he's going to be doing a seminar on pan pastels. And we've kind of been working hand in hand. These three have put their heads together, tried out a whole bunch of colors. We've been working with them. And we've actually came up with our own 10 series kits for turkey, mammal, three different fish, and bird. So you guys will be able to kind of see him do that at the, at the seminar. We'll bring it back to you. But thanks for tuning in. Like and share for your chance to win one of these guys next week. Um, Brett's going to be going live Friday, Friday at the Missouri show to walk through. And then we will still be doing our we'll Thursday doing live. Noses and eyes and lips and tear ducts. Probably. Noses, <laughs> eyes, and lips, tear ducts. Yeah. Sounds A lot. good. <laughs> so tune in. Thanks for watching, everybody. And you can catch all our Facebook videos in the past at our videos tab on Facebook. Thank you.